Welcome to TGC's Good Faith Debates. This is a series of conversations that are designed to help you navigate uh, issues or topics that are confusing, they could be contentious, they just could be difficult. And our hope is that we would be able to bring in people, talk about this in a way that is helpful to the viewer of these debates. My name is Jim Davis. I pastor Orlando Grace Church. It is my pleasure to be able to moderate these debates. And the topic at hand today is the relationship between racial reconciliation and racial justice. Are they inextricably linked, whether that's going forward or backward? Or is it possible for racial justice to move ahead even if racial reconciliation doesn't? So I'm for this conversation. I'm joined by Daryl Williamson, the lead pastor of Living Faith Bible Fellowship Church down the road from me in Tampa, Florida, and also by George Yancey, professor of religion and sociology at Baylor University. Thank you both for joining us for this important conversation. Daryl, we'll start with you. Can you give us your perspective on this issue? Sure. Um, first, let me just say I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of respect for you, Jim, and I appreciate what you do. And Dr. Yancey, um, I'm just really eager to uh, chat with you and, and to learn from you. Um, I appreciate the question, um, which is really to ask, can you have really one without the other? Can I have racial reconciliation with no racial justice? Is it possible for those who have a strong conviction about justice to move ahead with that without reconciliation? Uh, I think the answer, to be blunt, is absolutely not. You cannot really divorce those. Uh, and there, it may seem that there's conveniences in pursuing one versus the other, but I do think the way you asked it, that they are inextricably tied together. And so to, to go after reconciliation means to value the situation and circumstances of those who have experienced injustices. And so it's important not to trivialize those experiences or circumstances in light of relationship goals. And so the fact that we sit down together and have a meaningful moment does not set aside what folks experience outside of that moment. And, and so I think it's vital to recognize, to value all the folks who are involved, to see their, their dignity, to see their concerns, to value what's going on in their hearts. And so, for example, if we think about, not to spend too much time thinking about the history, uh, but if we think about like after the Civil War, um, man, when the, the federal troops were there in the South, uh, providing protection and cover for the freedmen, um, white Southerners were offended and they found that to be a profound injustice. And, and then went through protests and political maneuvering they were able to get the federal troops out. Uh, we saw um, kind of um, a reign of terror and control that emerged during the era of Jim Crow. And so if we believe that segregation is an injustice, I think looking back on it, it's easy. I mean, that's not, that's not controversial today. I think we'd have consensus on that. But if we were to concede that, I think we would agree that there's no way to try to achieve meaningful reconciliation even amongst black and white Christians in the South in the late 19th, early 20th century without dealing with um, the uh, subjugation that the freedmen, the, the, the black Southerners were experiencing. If we didn't take seriously their um, experiences of lynching, uh, the uh, um, stealing of land that had been given to them. In many cases, uh, there were reparational acts in the South that was done by certain slave owners. My family experienced uh, benefited from that. Uh, we don't talk about that a lot, but it is a reality in our history. But a lot of those things were, were stolen, were taken. And so there's no way to see meaningful uh, unity between black and white in the church, outside the church, if those injustices aren't dealt with. Now, why is that the case? Because ultimately, reconciliation is about peace or shalom. And so it's about a sense of settledness. And shalom does not mean paradise. It doesn't mean that we've arrived in heaven. It just means that, that we're all at a place where we can meaningfully experience what God has called us to for this age. And so if somehow our uh, cultural mandate calling is blocked or frustrated through injustices, we cannot have shalom. Now, 
I think the, the, the question for us is, okay, um, then how do we advance a shalom vision, which is to say, how do we advance both a reconciliation and justice vision in the church so that at the very least Christians can, can live this out? And obviously I think there's an impact that we would like to um, see the church have beyond its borders. I think it begins with, and I can't think of a better way of saying it, with us getting the gospel right. Now, when I say I, by the gospel, I don't mean a, a narrow definition of what God has done to account for our sinfulness, which, which is core to the gospel. We think about justification. But I think it's really more of a broader sense as to what is the baseline of our accountability before God? What will God judge us on when we stand before him? What is the basis of the judgment? And so, and I think that's a part of the gospel because our safety at the judgment is the good news, right? And so, and so I, I, I don't want to arrive there at risk. And, uh, and so I think it's important that, that we as pastors and leaders in the church help our people to understand that the judgment seat biblically is inherently ethical. It is not orthodoxical. And so it is not a, it's not a uh, doctrinal exam. And so you don't get to give the password. So I've accepted Christ as my savior. It is not the key to a favorable judgment. The key to a favorable judgment is a demonstrable righteousness that comes about because in the dwelling presence of the spirit and because we are regenerate. And so what is the basis of our regeneration at the judgment? It is not our confession. It is actually our living. And I think we need theologically our people to understand that, which I think changes the whole like conversation around injustice. Because now I see, if I think about Matthew 25, 31 through 48, I see that indifference to injustice or indifference to need, right? And so uh, when I was hungry, Jesus says, when I was thirsty, Jesus says, when I was naked, uh, when I was sick, when I was in prison, if you were indifferent to those things, that's a judgment problem. And so we need to take Christ's words very seriously. And I think that's really a good place for it to, for it to begin. I think if we, can, if we can broach that, it would change the attitude. So I think right now there's a lot of dismissiveness. I think we feel safe. Many of us feel we can safely dismiss the concerns of injustice because it's not consequential for my eschatological interest, right? But the truth of the matter is, it is very much in your interest to get, to get that right. It doesn't mean it's works righteousness. It just means it's the nature of the judgment. So I'll stop right there. Um, and um, so, yeah. That's helpful. I appreciate it. All right, Dr. Yancey, can we hear your perspective on things? Thanks for having me and uh, pleasure meeting you, Daryl. And I don't know if we're gonna have a lot of debate because I agree with almost all of everything he said. <laughs> Uh, I may come at it from a little bit different angle, but maybe that will where, where the debate will be. But, uh, you know, I, I agree with, with almost everything you said. Uh, so let me just go ahead and give you start <clears throat> some of my remarks. You probably remember the famous first scene from the movie The Godfather. Uh, that's the scene with Boncera, where he comes to The Godfather seeking justice. Now, if you remember correctly, you know, a big part of that scene was The Godfather said, well, you're not my friend. And that is a part of it. But another part was when The Godfather teaches us about justice. You see, Boncera had his daughter who refused to have sex with her boyfriend beaten. She was beaten by her boyfriend and a friend. Boncera wanted the men killed. The godfather, a criminal overlord, stated, that is not justice. Your daughter, though violated, is a lie. And even when he agrees to take justice, he, he talks about having careful men to make sure that they are not killed. See, justice is important, but justice can be corrupted. If we're not careful, justice can lead to revenge. You know, The Godfather is a fictional movie, and we know this. But as Christians, we know that there's a truth here, that justice can turn into revenge, and even people who are victimized can become victimizers themselves. Research has shown that kids who grow up in abused families, their parents abuse them, grew up to abuse their parents when their parents are elderly. 
So we know that just because someone's victimized does not mean that what they want is justice because sometimes what they want is revenge. Okay, it's a fictional movie. Does this happen in real life? Yes, it does. When Castro took over, it was in, in, in response to Pastistas, who had an oppressed regime. And the, but that movement, what Castro created, was movement of reprisals and taking away of rights. And even though the Cuban people had been oppressed, it did not justify the movement that came after that. I think of the family of Nik Nikolos Romanov, who his family, him, his wife, and his kids were killed because he supported autocratic rule. That movement was seeking justice, and what they got was revenge. So how do we make sure that instead of justice, instead of revenge, we get justice? Well, the answer, some people may not like, but it comes down to the instruments of justice cannot remain in the hands of a single group, even the group that is victimized. As Christians, we understand this because we understand the nature of human depravity. And if we want justice, then we have to find ways in which everyone has a seat at the table. The way we find real justice is that we bring everyone in there. Now, I can already hear the arguments. If I acknowledge depravity, how can I acknowledge depravity when the group that benefited from the injustice has a say at the table? How is that acknowledging, you know, how's, how's, how's that? Because are they not going to maintain their injustice when we give them a seat at the table? And the detractors are correct. If we keep the same polarizing conversations we have, individuals who've gained from the injustice of the past will continue to fight justice, subtle and overt ways. They have no reason not to. So if we really want to have justice, sustaining justice, we must bring them into the conversation. We must have reconciliation, we must have unity. Unity and justice have to happen together. Another argument I hear, how can I ask people of color to enter into conversation with others given the emotional toll that's had on them. How can I ask people of color to, to come into this conversation and come to the conversation in a way when it's not a fair conversation because they bring this emotional baggage? I understand this critique because I too understand what it's like to pour my heart out on racial issues to a majority group member and have them swatted away because as if it's nothing. This conversation is going to be costly for all of us, but it's probably going to be more costly for people of color. There's no doubt about that. But what is the alternative? To not have the conversation? To tell people to go read a book and then come back and do what I want you to do? Unfortunately, a lot of what's happened in our society under anti-racism has to tell whites, go and do what people of color tell you to do. And that's not going to do it because that's not going to get us to justice. Even though it's uncomfortable, we have to have these conversations and they have to have, be important conversations. I have to put myself out there. I want to hear from the person who has emotional pain and I want to be there for them. But I have to know that because they have emotional pain does not mean that I have to agree with them if they head towards revenge instead of justice. So we have to have those sort of conversations. How do we bring everyone on board? We have to create a place for everyone to be involved in this conversation a place on the table. I don't have the right to dismiss anyone's concerns because I don't understand them. Just like they don't have the right to dismiss my concerns because they don't understand my concerns. We must hear from everyone's concerns. People of color have an interest in receiving justice, but whites have an interest in not experiencing revenge. And we have to understand all those concerns if we really want to get to where we want to get to. But justice will occur when we begin to work together. Here's what research says about how we really convince people to work with us. We build rapport. We admit when they have a good point. We try to understand where they're coming from. We do those things that build community instead of polarization. Polarization works against justice. We should want a less polarized society if we want justice because what polarization does is it creates the need to have enemies to fight against. And therefore, you have people who see justice as their enemy rather than as something that they should want. If we want true justice, balanced justice, then we have to have racial reconciliation. We have to bring unity along with that. Some feel that entering into such conversations lets whites off the hook. I would say that our desire to keep them on the hook can prevent us from, from finding true, balanced justice. 
because we're so eager to keep them on the hook that we don't neglect when we may be going overboard. You see, if we believe in human depravity, everyone has to be held in check to some degree because human depravity knows no race. It manifests itself in different races in different ways, perhaps, but it knows no race. Therefore, we must find ways in which we must have this conversation. If we are honest, if we're honest, there are whites who don't, want to, who don't care what we have to say. But we're also honest, there are people of color who really want revenge and really aren't seeking honest justice. For this reason, I believe we will not have justice until we have some sort of racial reconciliation unity. This is not to say that justice is not uh, something we strive for. I'm saying that this is the best way to achieve it, is to work together. The process of working together to find unity is a process of finding justice as well. You cannot divorce one without the other. You cannot get justice first, because justice first usually is a group deciding what justice is for everyone. And our human experience has shown how awfully wrong that can go. Thank you. Well, let's, a conversation like this, it's always helpful to start by defining our terms. You, you def, uh, the, specifically reconciliation and justice. For justice, you use shalom, which I hear making the world the way it ought to be. Is that a fair definition? The, the way you... it was created to be. Right. I, I think that there is a way the world is intended to be, which has not been set aside fully by the fall. And so I, I don't think that shalom in that sense, again, entails perfection. It's not a return to Eden or anything like that. It simply is an ought for humanity in this age. And I think it's fair for us to call that. I think that's a form of shalom. Okay. And how would you, how would you define reconciliation? So I think reconciliation is an interesting one. And I think it needs to occur contextually. Uh, and so, and so, and but that, for, so for me, that means, and this is, I think reconciliation is a, it can be a bridge to justice, though I think they, they occur together. Reconciliation is a convergence upon the truth. And so re reconciliation is not a relationship personality. It's not our sitting down and feeling good about each other. You know, we can talk without screaming. Uh, that's not reconciliation. One reason why I think that's not is because there are power dynamics in those relationships. And so re re reconciliation is a shared understanding of the truth. And so I think justice is always one. There's God's justice. It's not justice based on my experience or justice based on someone else's experience. It's really, it's really our trying to find God's perspective. We are reconciled when we have arrived at a shared understanding as to what has happened and how we might meaningfully go forward. Not I mean that in a thematic sense, not in a particular, not in a programmatic sense, but we realize the nature of what it means to go forward. For example, you've been disenfranchised. Enfranchising you is a part of the forward narrative that connects to a historical narrative. If we can't get to that, we're talking about detente. And, and I don't think it's what we mean when we say reconciliation. So I think we need to push into a shared understanding of the truth. We have that then we can be, and I would say we are at the, really at the, uh, the gateway to reconciliation. Okay. How do you feel about those definitions of justice and reconciliation? Do you agree? Yeah. You know, uh, I probably come at it a little bit more sociologically because it's, it's who I am. Uh, when, I, when I define justice, I define justice as, you know, fair, and, and I agree that, you know, God's the ultimate justice. And, you know, God, j justice, well, things are contextualized. Ultimately, there's a God and, and, and God's above all. But, you know, that people are treated fairly so that if, you know, the guilty are punished and the innocent are, are set free. You know, so I think that in a more generalized sense, when we think about groups, it's, you know, it's a little bit different uh, because if we're talking about justice in, in, in light of uh, our historical racism and our structural racism, it's not, you know, it's not like you go up to white people and say, well, you're guilty and you need to be punished. But what we want to do is we want to try to create a fair society because for that white person, because they live in a society like this one, there have been certain uh, things that have happened that are unfair and that we want to correct. It's not about punishing that person. I think the, that's a misconception that some people have that when people talk about justice, it's about, oh, you want to punish white people. Uh, no. Now, once again, you know, my, my concern is that, that we focus so much on that that we forget that you can go overboard in trying to make corrections. Over corrections can be made. And I gave a couple of examples of things that I think we would agree are not justice, even though the thing that happened beforehand was not good. What ultimately happened 
was not good as, uh, either. So uh, when I think about racial reconciliation, I think about racial reconciliation, uh, you know, there's, there's the ultimate reconciliation that happens on the other side of the grave, okay? That's, that's something that, that's a goal, but it's not something that we're gonna have in this lifetime. On this side of the grave, I, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to, best, to do the best we can to, uh, to, to, to love other image bearers uh, in, in a way that is right. Uh, that means different things for different people. That, that's, a, that's a very uh, broad definition. Because I don't think that what, what it means to love other image bearers is the same thing for individuals in, in the same context. There are some principles that are the same, you know, uh, but you know, when you get to the, the specifics, especially given our history in the United States, it's not gonna be exactly the same. I think that's something that, that's key. But to get there though, we have to, uh, I don't want George Yancey to say, here's what needs to be done, because George Yancey is biased. George Yancey needs to be held in check by other people and hearing other concerns so that hopefully together we can work what that really looks like. Just say, I think that, and I don't disagree, I think, I do disagree with some things, I think, but it's just minor. Um, but I do think that we can, we can often find that justice, we believe that justice is something programmatic, that it's a policy thing. And policies flow out of justice, but I don't think that is justice. And so what, what we can share is a narrative. What we can share, there is, there is an American narrative or idea that despite the various political perspectives that we've seen historically, but that was shared about American Republican democracy. No one was coming along and suggesting that we have a monarch. No one would come along and suggest that we eliminate the presidency. And so there was a shared narrative. I think we need a shared narrative about our racial history and about our, like, what it looks like to see that resolved in the future. It needs to be somewhat inspirational. And so we, we, we get too quickly into these programmatic discussions and we've not resolved our differing convictions. And now I do think there's, there are some facts, there are some, some history, some, some measurables to help us to build that narrative. But narratives aren't about precision. Narratives are about direction. So where are we trying to go? What does it mean for us to go together? And, and how do we go together recognizing how it's gone down in the past? Black, just, just, if you think about black and white kind of experiences of racialization in this country, it has not been like in balance. And so we have to deal with and acknowledge that imbalance and recognize that without a shared narrative, some people will feel aggrieved even when say, simply being required, say, to make certain concessions or compromises to rectify the situation. And we need to be able to deal with that is that not all perceived grievances are perhaps, I don't want to use the term objective, but they, 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 those grievances may be situational to me and what I want, but they need to fit better with our understanding as to what actually happened. And I think that we need to push toward a shared understanding of that. That doesn't mean 100% unanimity. It just means there's a strong consensus. I think especially within the church, we ought to have, because this is an ethical issue, we should share the same ethical narrative. If we have a different ethical narrative, that's a real problem. That's a theological problem. And so I think we need to push into that and see if we can get to a consensus of what, what that narrative is. One more definitional question. Do you use the terms racial reconciliation and racial harmony synonymously, synonymously or do you think those are different things? I think they're related. Uh, I would think about it, I, you know, something about, about it seems like, well, they're not the, exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, it seems to me that you probably would get harmony through racial reconciliation, but you could have har racial harmony without racial reconciliation, if you get what I'm saying. So th 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 I think that's what, that's what feels a little off on me, that they're not exactly the same. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think reconciliation is redemptive and restorative, right? And so we've had an issue with trying to come back together. Something has created a breach. Harmony uh, is a state, right? And so here we are, it's, it's harmonious. Uh, it, doesn't, it, it, it does not require there ever being a history of division and things like that. <clears throat> so, George, you said that if we're not careful, our motives can slip into revenge. And you know, we, we have people advocating different positions, even in previous debates and um, 
and obviously you're not insinuating revenge on their part, whichever one, um, whichever side the argument there is. But but how might we check our our souls, our spirits in in this argument to to know if revenge is maybe a prime motivating factor, or if we've crossed that line somewhere? So I would think I'm thinking most people who engage in revenge don't think they're doing revenge. Okay. Uh, they think they think they're doing what they're doing is right. I think the people who killed uh, the uh, you know the, the uh, Romanov's family thought they were doing the right thing, you know. So so that's the that's the thing. All right. So how do we know? I think we have to hear other people because I think that is an important check. Uh, I think we have to hear their concerns, and I think we have to try to address their, their concerns. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that we have to say, "All right, this is what you want. I'm gonna give you 100 percent what you want." No one gets 100% of what they want. We, it's dangerous to give us humans 100% of what we want. We don't do well with that. With that. But we have to hear and, and take that into consideration. And if you're married, you know what that means. You know, you, if you're married, if you, if you get 100% of what you want, there's a problem because you're, the bill is coming due, all right? So you, know, so you have to be very careful we need to negotiate and argue with one another and, and, and argue in a good way, not in a polarizing way. And I want to be also clear on this. Uh, what, m my thing is that we all have to enter into this discussion honestly and open to listen to everyone else. That is something that I think everybody has in common. What I'm not saying we're going to have in common is the solution. The solution is because something's worked out. And given our racial history, a lot of times, perhaps not all the times, but a lot of times, the solution is going to look like, well, whites are going to have to make more adjustments than people of color. I think that that's perfectly fair, given our racial history. But even knowing that, if we don't enter that conversation in a way where we're going to hear people out, then we're setting up the people, well, first, us just scripturally, you know, the Bible tells us to think about the, the interests of others, all right? So, I mean, we, we may want to get away from that, but that's there. But even just practically, you know, empirically, we set people up for a backlash. And we set people up to, to fight us every step of the way. And that's not how we're going to get there either. So that's a big part of what I'm advocating is that, you know, that we, uh, we check ourselves by being in conversation with others in a way that's respectful to them, in a way that's productive, that we build on each other's ideas and we move forward. I like that. And we're going to get to the practical things, the moving forward things from both of your comments. But I want to ask you, Daryl, George, and make sure I say this, I quote you correctly. I heard him say racial justice cannot move forward without racial reconciliation. Do you agree with that? I don't, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I think that they travel together. I think they're very much bound together. That does not mean that they're exactly the same thing. And it doesn't mean that all considerations for justice have a reconciliation a reconciliation kind of attribute. And so I know we're going to get to some of the practical things, but I'll just say this now. There are various expressions of racial injustice in our society. And I think particularly around meaningful disparities. And so those disparities being addressed is not something that we simply need to sit down and kind of talk about how you feel about it. How do you feel about the fact that there are significantly worse healthcare outcomes for black people. That's not a discussion item. And so we need to take that thing as a very serious data point of injustice and figure out how to eradicate that disparity. I think that's true in a whole variety of ways. And so, so I think it's essential that we recognize that there are key aspects of injustices that aren't things that we simply resolve in a conversation, but we do have to recognize that that's a major problem in our national in a church narrative, and that we want to address those disparities and to bring the right people to the table to solve that problem and not simply to get to a consensus. So I said I had my last definitional question. Uh, I was wrong. George, you said that you fear that much of what we see today in anti-racism emphasizes telling white people that their job is to do what people of color want without question. Anti-racism is a very technical term. Would you mind just fleshing that out a little bit and defining that term? Sure, so uh, when I wrote my book, what I did was I read the major anti-racism books that were popular at that time. So, you know, uh, D'Angelo was the, was the number one, but there's the other ones out there. And I looked for just 
tendencies among them because I wanted to know popular anti-racism. I was less concerned about, you know, the academic anti-racism, which, you know, in a, in a journal that all 15 people read. So I wanted to know, you know, the anti-racism people are talking about what they mean. And that's where I, I saw certain things that popped up in almost every book and article that I saw. And one of them was this sort of notion uh, that they talked a lot about whites and what whites should be doing. And so I just came to the conclusion that, you know, in popularized anti-racism, there's an expectation that whites are to do what people of color want them to do. And my challenge is, if I'm incorrect, then find me the popular anti-racism book that doesn't do that. Because I could not find that book when I, was, when I was reading all these books. And to me, that is one of the problems. There's a lot of anti-racism that I actually like and agree with. But I think that's a major problem in it. All right, so I want to go back to this phrase, racial justice cannot move forward without racial reconciliation. I, I think I hear, and I, I agree with both of you, that they are inextricably linked. They, go, they move forward together, maybe one ahead of the other. But just in case someone's out there thinking this, does that open you up to the, um, the claim that that would not have solved slavery? That there are times when people were not hearing from everybody, um, that we need to move, maybe even programmatically, if you want to call it that, that justice just has to go forward even when the reconciliation is not, or maybe you just say the, the gap is larger. How do, you, how do you apply that framework to something horrible like American slavery? Right, so we're, you know, we're talking about something different today than back in slavery, okay. praise God. Yeah. Okay. So slavery, definitely we need a civil war. Civil rights movement, we needed a politi powerful political movement. The challenge today, because if you think about it, the challenge today through slavery, through Jim Crowism, through all that, was uh, are people of color, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, human? That was the question people had in their, I mean, that's, I mean, we treat people like that, you're treating them as less than human. That is not the major question today. If you ask people, you know, are people of color human? Everyone's gonna say, yeah, of course. How, how dare you ask me that question? The question today is, how do we overcome our centuries of racial abuse in a way that people think is fair? And that's where you get your disagreement. So you are right. There are times in which you got to do the military or political or, 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 you know, there are times where you have those sort of overt discrepancies that the only way you can do is just change them. And it's very clear. But it's not quite as clear how we move forward in a way that's fair. And that's why you know, we're looking at a different challenge. And we, we can't do what we did in the 1960s and think it's gonna work as well in the year 2022. That's helpful. So the one thing I would say to that is, even though I agree that if you were to ask people about the humanity of black or brown people that they would give you an affirming answer, I think the question is, is, is there a perception of equal value that's evidenced in people's behavior. And so do we see responses to people, whether it be attitude-driven responses or whether it be degrees of engagement and energy like we see in healthcare? And so I think that the equal humanity in every way that matters of black, brown, white people in our society is very much in question today. And, and, and not just about kind of just the mere legacy of like kind of institutional implications of historic racism. But how does bias play out in life, in life prospects, what it means in terms of one's ability to flourish? And so, and that is a formational issue. That's, that's a hard issue. In some ways it's a hard issue, but they don't have enough time to talk about kind of the sociology of bias. And, um, but but I, I do think that we need to recognize that when black people are perceived that they're not perceived as white people in our society. Is, I, I don't know if, if that's even something that's, that's debatable. Maybe some folks out of some sense of ideological conviction would debate it. But I think we know that. I think if we're honest, we know that's the truth. And so, and we have to be able to deal with that. We can't, and that's a justice issue and a reconciliation issue. And so it's a justice issue because those prejudices lead to disparate outcomes. And so those things need us to lean into 
And I think in this sense, it's important for us not to disparage some, uh, fully disparage the anti-racism people, even those that perhaps we disagree with on some things. I think that D'Angelo and those guys are trying to raise awareness or trying to create a sense of self-awareness about how people are acting in ways that they just don't recognize. And here is some evidence. This is anecdotal. It's not necessarily quantitative, but anecdotal experiences is a part of the human experience. And so we're more than measures. Uh, there are motivations that we have that are not precise. There are convictions that we feel. We can't tell you why, but we have them. And so, and so these things are very racialized. And I think that's a key part of the racial justice and racial reconciliation agenda is to deal with those kinds of prejudices, which I think is a formational problem. And that's a, a longer conversation. Uh, but I think it's a formational issue. And yeah, there's, there's there, no but... doubt that there's biases and prejudice that people have towards people of color. There's, there's no doubt about that. Here's where I think, well, here's why I think it's so important that this point is, you know, whether you're fully human or not. Because the way you can approach people totally changes when they have to acknowledge you're human, even if they are biased. For example, you know, I've had great experiences talking to, to many whites who at first started, and I, I think for a lot of them, it's, it's, it's a matter of, uh, uh, they don't care enough about what's happening, you know, which, which I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying but it's a different challenge than, say, the Civil War and, and Jim Crowism and that sort of thing. So when you can, when you can uh, find a way to, to, to hit that humanity to go, oh, I should care, it changes. Whereas that was really not available when we're talking about the Civil War, we're talking about Jim Crowism, we're talking about putting Native Americans on reservations and, 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 and this sort of stuff. Because they were not seen as fully human. And so I think that that is a, that is a you know, when I think about the challenge today, I think that's a critical difference, challenges of the day as opposed to what we've had for most of our history. That's helpful. Daryl, I'm interested in the eschatological ramifications to pull on that third a little bit. I also appreciate that you were clear. We're not taught, we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. Mm -hmm. There is that, but that doesn't get us off the hook either in the terms of the ethical and the way that we live our lives. That isn't a reason to not to just to throw up our hands and not do anything. So I, I'm a pastor um, and I talk with other pastors and this is probably true of a lot of just white people, maybe people in general, but I'm gonna zero in on white pastors for a moment. I get accused of saying too much and not saying enough. And, and I've heard you talk about the eschatological ramifications directly in reference to white people not saying enough. And there, there are lots of injustices. There are more injustices in the world than I would have time to speak out against. What advice do you have for people, let's, just, let's say pastors for right now, white pastors even, how do we know the line? We're also, we're also shepherding a specific group of people that God has given us. They're gonna all look very different. And so just some, some, some advice on how to steward that, to know when to speak, when not to speak, when you're running too far ahead of your congregation, you know, just shepherding stuff. I, I think that's a great question, brother. I think there, there are a couple of things here. I think the, the fundamental issue is the issue of discipleship, which is to help our people to understand what it looks like to follow Jesus, what it looks like to be shaped into Christ likeness. One of the things that Dallas Willard says, which I agree with, is that to be a disciple of Christ, to be a mature disciple of Christ, is to have an inner life that's like Jesus' inner life. And there's, there's a sense in which our motivations are motivations toward the other. I think we, as we disciple people, we have to help them to take Jesus' words seriously. And that Christ's words becomes the center of gravity of the kingdom agenda. And we need to be honest with ourselves as pastors that we've been mentored and shaped in ways to not value Christ's words as core. So for example, uh, several years ago, uh, TGC, we had a panel discussion around if Jesus uh, preached the gospel. Hmm. And it was interesting. It was very good. I mean, it was a, a very helpful. Tim Keller, Don Carson, John Piper, very helpful dialogue, and we greatly benefited from it. However, the rhetorical question, the fact that it gives some buzz to us is a problem. The fact that we can ask the question, did Jesus teach the gospel, it helps us understand that there's something in our understanding of the gospel that perhaps is deficient, it's a, it's a miniature, it's a shrunken gospel. It's not that it's invalid, it's just that it's miniature. And I don't think we've taken seriously 
the regenerative work of the Spirit, that the Spirit of God has done more to just cover us in Christ's righteousness. He, we, the, his righteousness is imputed to us, but we are meant to be changed. And the way the New Testament deals with the apologetics of the faith is largely to think about it ethically. And so whether it's John, 1 John 3, 4, and 5, he's very clear about what the implications of lovelessness are. Lovelessness is gracelessness. Gracelessness is godlessness. And so we need to help our folks feel on the race conversation what we think about this, how we feel about this, matters magnificently. Now, I'm not just talking about a loss of rewards and things like that. I'm saying to you, recognize that what Jesus did for you is not the same thing as being changed by the Spirit of God into a new kind of human being. And so we need to help folks to feel that we're not judging anyone. No warning in Scripture is a condemnation. They're simply an attempt to provide a framework for understanding what it means to be in Christ. And I think as pastors, and it's not just on the race issue, it's on every relational concern. I do not have the license to hate or to diminish people because I affirm certain doctrinal truths. It doesn't work that way. And I think Paul makes it very clear. He says, don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. Anyone who lives like this, this is why the wrath of God has come. And so as pastors, our calling is to present everyone perfect in Christ. That's Colossians 1.28. That's our call. And so we need to make sure that our people whom we are responsible for understand what it means to be in Christ, what it means to live in a Christ-like way, and how we should think of other human beings. And if you are devaluing the situation circumstances of other people, that is an eschatological problem. I can't make you any assurances. I can't give you any guarantees. Just because you understand a principle or a truth does not mean it's a reality for you. I think that was James's point in James chapter 2. And so, so I think as pastors, brother, it's important that we, it's less about the race issue, but it's inclusive of that. We've got to help our folks know that being in Christ is a life and a love. And if those two things are absent, I don't care what you have definitionally, you don't have Christ. And the reason why that's the case is not because of some rule. It's because it's the Spirit's work, and He's powerful enough, He's charismatic enough to make that work efficacious, man. It's, it's real. It's going to happen, and I think we need to help them to, to understand that. So what I'm hearing is it's possible to be accomplishing that and be quiet on social media. Ha! <laughs> I, I think I, there are I, good reasons to be quiet on social yeah, media yeah, yeah. just as a principle, right? <laughs> well, I, I know, I, I, I know a, a Christian leader who's fairly quiet on social media about these things, and he gets attacked for it, but you look at his private life, and he's very much investing yes. his time and energies in individuals in his context, both in the church and outside of the Amen. church. Amen. Amen. And he's probably accomplishing more than the loudest of us on social media. Amen, brother. Um, all right, we've talked about formation and discipleship. I think we've established that it, that it happens at the relational level. I'd love to hear each of you talk about practical things that we can be moving toward in the church to be seeing this happen more, increasingly more in our own context. Amen. I think you mentioned formation first, so I'll start with you, and sure. then I want to hear your... So thoughts. I think the, the, the key thing about formation is that we have, formation is only really meaningfully achieved in a formational environment, and that's meant to be the church. And so I think what that means for us in this issue, I think it means multi-ethnic, multicultural churches as a goal, that we should pursue that in a way that folks wiring about how they perceive people of different ethnicities and cultures can be reworked. I think the gospel, a gospel community is intended to reshape how we perceive each other. Paul says that, right? We no longer view anyone from a worldly uh, point of view. And so that community reshapes and de redefines my biases. And so I, th I think that's first. We've got to go after that. I think within that, we have to educate people on the reality of these racial disparities and what some people in our churches are dealing with just to get to raise their antenna that this is not just a political issue or a social issue, it's an issue for my brother, it's an issue for my sister. And I begin to experience their encounter with these things. I think that makes me more sensitive and I become an advocate both for them and also for other folks who have that same experience. 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you. But I, I, So I want to ask a question about practically developing that and say my own context. I'm a, I'm a white man pastoring a church, largely white church. You and I were talking about a dear friend just a minute ago who's a black man who is pastoring a truly multi-ethnic PCA church in Orlando. And um, as a white man, though, I feel it's challenging to move that ball forward. And, and, and you and I have talked about this, we're, we're trying. What are, some, what are some things you would urge your white pastor brothers and church leaders, mm. sisters too, what, what are some places you want to nudge us, we, we wanna hear? So there are two things I would recommend to them. Um, I can, maybe there's three. And let me start with the third one that just came to mind. I don't think it means leading your church to become multicultural. And, and I think that the reason why I think it's not that, if it's a larger white church, is that you're probably going to end up creating an environment that's going to feel alien, alien and perhaps hostile to people of color who come in there. So I think it's important not to try to diversify white spaces as a strategy for, for pursuing multi-ethnicity, multicultural churches. I think there are two things, though, that we can do. One is that we can, like our friend, we can plant, we can establish the DNA going into a church we can plant multicultural, multi-ethnic churches, churches that are reconciled and also just. So I think we can plant those churches. Here's another thing that we can do that we don't talk about nearly enough. I think that we can diversify largely black and Latino churches. That's our church's story. Our church was planted as an African-American church. That was its definition. We are today a multicultural church, about 40% black, about 35% white, and about 25% Latino, brown Latino. And so I think that the churches of color are safe spaces for everyone existentially. No one's gonna, so if a white brother or sister comes in, they're not going to get hurt there. That, I mean, it could happen because it's, these are human beings. But, but largely, it's a comfortable place for everyone. And it's also less likely to have these culture wars inside the church around issues like racial justice. And so I think those two things, I think, planting those churches, I think diversifying churches of color, and I think in white churches, kind of educating your people on the issues can be done without trying to change the church, which will lead to conflict, tension, and resistance. That's a good word. Thank you. All right, formation and discipleship to move both reconciliation and justice forward in the context of our local church. What what advice do you have? Yeah, so uh, as I think about that question, I, mean, I think two things come to mind. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a theologian. I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> but, you know, one thing I think that we get things right as Christians that they're not getting around the rest of the world is the nature of what humans are. You know, because of our idea of depravity, we know that humans are of great worth and depraved, whereas in a humanist philosophy, only humans are of great worth. Which means that we know in interacting with others, well, first, Human depravity, the doctrine of human depravity always starts with me. It always starts with me, and then I can I understand others. So it doesn't, hey, y'all are deprived, you need to, no. If I really understand that doctrine, it means I need to learn from everyone else. And, you know, beyond race, this has such implications as to what we should be as Christians. I mean, I think that's something that uh, I would like to see churches teach more about the nature of what humans are, depraved and yet still image bearers of God. You know, what does that mean? And how, how confident should we be that we have all the answers given, given this? And I talk about this as a sociologist, as confirmation bias and such, but really it's, it, 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 it's truth from on high. Good science and good theology go together. So it's, so it's that. On a more practical level, on a more practical level, you know, I think that we need to try to live a lifestyle that is more collaborative in our, in our conversations and inclusive. That means first off, it means, yeah, having diverse friendships. If you don't, in this day and age of the internet, what's wrong with you, honestly? Second, be willing to have the conversation. My best friend in high, in, not in high school, in college was a white guy. Uh, we talked about God, we talked about girls, we talked about politics, we talked about everything but race. I had another friend who was a Hispanic, who wasn't, I wasn't as close, but we talked about racial issues. That's on me that I was unwilling to have the conversation. He did not ever push it away, okay? I don't wanna blame him, that was me. I was unwilling to have the conversation. We had to be willing to have the conversation. 
when it comes up in an appropriate manner. It's not when you meet someone and say, hey, let's talk about race. But when it comes up in an appropriate manner, we have to have the conversation so we can understand each other. Not conversations to brow people, to beat people down or anything like that. So we can understand one another, to use principles of collaboration so that we can build rapport and understand where they're coming from and agree when they have a good point and these sort of things. We need to engage in those conversations. And over time, we need to build communities. We need to build organizations that promote this sort of idea. I think that this idea goes against the, what the world is saying. And that's, that's fine. Because I think the solution to racism resides in the church. We just have not done it. We instead have gone along with what the world has done. The world says be colorblind, we'll be colorblind. The world says do this, we'll do this. We need to set the agenda, which is working together with reconciliation, and as we do that, finding ways to achieve justice. And you know, one of the things that I, I just feel, you know, the, the only difference between Daryl and me, other than some minor things, is he approached this as, no, we have to have justice as we go along. And I'm saying, no, we have to have uh, reconciliation as we go along. And we kind of both agree, we just came in from different angles. And so I think that we're kind of saying the same thing. We can't leave one without the other, because if you do, you know, I'll have the dangers of revenge, but you can't leave behind justice, or else you have the dangers of injustice. But that will come in the conversations, and that will come in working together and learning about each other and caring about each other. Well, that's a good point. What if, what if we kind of land the plane a little bit with two questions? The first is, you know, you talk about the the reconciliation, maybe you're emphasizing the reconciliation side a little more and you're emphasizing the justice side a little more. I'd love for you to address the each extreme. M maybe you can address the extreme on the reconciliation side that would say, why do anything? You know, that would be the extreme. And the extreme on the justice side would say, we need things changed no matter what, and we're gonna push policies and arguments and articles and social media to that end, going far ahead of the re true formational uh, reconciliation. So if, if, if y'all would, I'd love for y'all to engage those two extremes. We'll start you with you. You want me to start with me? Okay. So here's what it looks like when you, uh, you push reconciliation and don't concern justice. What happens is that people start thinking, okay, let's not rock the boat. And so if you bring up something, oh, you're rocking the boat. And what happens is that people are called racist for bringing up issues of concern. And so that is, that's what happens when you, when you say, well, we, we, need to be, we need to come together and love one another and let's not talk about these issues of justice. And you know, couldn't you, people of color, put aside those issues for the sake of reconciliation? And I think you know, the way that I, and, I gave, you, I gave you examples of how I see this, but I think just describing that shows why that cannot work. For as a person of color, you know, part of who I am is as an African American, and part of it, I understand that justice can get out of hand, but you know, I know that there are things that need to be corrected, and I want to work towards that. I'm willing to work towards that. I'm willing to to work towards that, working with people, not to impose. But I have to feel like we're working towards that. So that's great. So that you said it well, reconciliation without justice. So what's the danger of justice without reconciliation? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I think Martin King addressed this really well uh, in one of his last speeches is that we can find ourselves in desegregation and having in some ways some kind of physical proximity but spiritual distance. And I, I don't think it's good enough. Let's think first inside the church. It is definitely not good enough for the church to not truly be the church. We need to be joined. We need a shared spirituality. We need a shared experience of the spirit of God. And so that requires us to be reconciled. We cannot be the church and be somehow separate while achieving restorative things for people. And so I think that that, that would be a social vision and not really a redemptive vision. So I think it's important that we don't lose that. I think in the broader society though, it's important, even though we can't talk about community like we can go after in the church, I think God does have a vision still for uh, a community, kind of a common grace community. And so we want that to be in place as well. We don't wanna have compartmentalized, this kind of like balkanized reality. And so, because what that does, it sets us up for future 
conflict. And the only way to, to, to mitigate that is to have a shared sense, shared sense of community. That's a good answer. Last question for the both of you. Realistically, yeah, we live in the already not yet. <laughs> Jesus has inaugurated his kingdom. It will not be fully consummated until he gives, comes back. And that's where we live. So realistically, how much do you think can and should be accomplished this side of the second coming? We'll start with you, Joe. Yeah, I think that is true for all of our relationships and our marriages. And we know that our marriages aren't going to be perfect, but they can also still be good. I've been married for 34 years now. It's a very, very good marriage. I don't know what I said to my wife, but she married me. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm grateful for that. Uh, I think we can have healthy churches. Uh, all healthy churches will have issues that they're dealing with. So it, it's not the uh, consummated kingdom. And so I think the Lord would have us to pursue justice now. So I think about the Lord, Isaiah 59, where he talks about, he looks and he sees this absence of justice. It bothers him. I think it bothers him if we're not going after it now and we'll make progress toward it. Perfection, no, but real gain I think is possible because we're made in God's image and we can actually affect meaningful change. Thanks. George. Yeah, I mean, I think that's well said. I mean, you know, I, I do not expect perfection. Uh, I need grace, so I better give grace. And so when people mess up, I better be there to, to, to have grace if they are truly, you know, if, if, if someone asks for repentance, I need to be there for them. Uh, and so we're, go we're going to make mistakes moving forward. But I think that we can make the effort moving forward. I think that's very important to keep working moving forward, dealing with this issue, dealing with that issue, and keep moving forward, even though there will still be issues out there. And that process, the process of doing that is going to be is going to produce real racial harmony, not fake racial harmony, real racial harmony as we learn how to love one another and learn how learn about our own inadequacies. So I think that we can do that, even though we know that we're going to mess up. Others going to be going to mess up. We're still going to move forward. Well, thank you. I really thank you both for, for joining us, for giving your time, for practicing what you preach, for living what you encourage. These are um, complicated, complex, and even personal issues. And I just appreciate you being open and transparent and giving so much of your time and mental life and emotional life to formation and discipleship and moving us forward, both at a local level, but things like this, you're doing at a larger level too. So I appreciate both of you. And to you out there online, I hope that this has been a helpful and profitable use of your time and our prayers that God would use it in your life and that the things that these brothers are talking about would advance increasingly through you in your local context. Blessings. Amen.